Good afternoon, colleagues. Good morning, good evening to all of you, wherever you are. Um, I would like to welcome you to this webinar on resilient drylands, innovating for sustainable agricultural landscape and livelihoods. My name is Yurdi Yasmi, and I'm a special coordinator for the Plant Production and Protection Division at FAO. It is really a great honor to see many of you joining this webinar, and I'm pretty sure some will still join later on. Um, so it's encouraging to see you know, how uh, the subject matters is relevant for, for all of us. Colleagues, I invite you also to introduce yourself in chat room, maybe where you are from, so that we know, you know, uh, in terms of where you know where you are, and, and and so forth. So feel free to to write your name and you know your country, where you are based. So the drylands, you know, are very important topics for FAO and for all of us not only because of the significant contribution to agriculture, but also for peculiarities of the, of the drylands and a lot in you know, peculiarity of challenges that they are facing. So today we are so pleased to have an opportunity to discuss this, to share lesson learned, to share best practices. And also, you know, we look forward to get your feedback and views on how we can actually work on dryland better in the future to address the issues of poverty, food insecurity, and malnutrition. Colleagues, uh, participants, uh, and, and esteemed uh, panels, without further ado, uh, I would like to start this webinar by inviting uh, Ms. Beth Beckdahl, FAO Deputy Director General, to give her welcoming remark. Beth, over to you. Thanks very much, Yuri, and to all of our distinguished guests, uh, to all of our colleagues uh, and uh, everyone who is with us here today. Uh, obviously, we are pulling from a very global audience, so I need to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to each of you, depending upon your geographic location. I do very much appreciate everyone's taking the time to join us today for, I think, this important discussion. Yurdi has already indicated that uh, dry lands certainly have their own unique uh, characteristics. Um, and they are critical to achieving global food security. And so drawing attention uh, through today's webinar on how we innovate for sustainable agricultural landscapes and livelihoods, I think is an incredibly timely discussion. I'm also really pleased to see some familiar and friendly faces here on the screen. Uh, Jackie Hughes uh, here uh, with us again uh, as our partner, uh, Ikrasat uh, and FAO have worked on many things together over the years and with her role as Director General we have very recently uh, been able to take on a number of these important types of topics together. But we are also joined by a number of other distinguished speakers uh, from across many continents. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from them, uh, hopefully meeting them in the future as well, because I know they will enrich today's discussions, uh, each bringing their own perspectives and their unique knowledge. I have, I think, many ways the easy job uh, of setting the stage a little bit, and then I get to listen. Uh, it's not often that I get to sort of sit in the background and really soak in the information and the knowledge from so many of our partners. But let me try uh, to do just a little bit of, of staging for today's uh, webinar discussion. We, I think, all appreciate that dry lands uh, make up over 40% of the Earth's land surface. They are home to 2 billion people on the planet and also supply about 60% of the world's food production, making them a very unique type of ecosystem, but one that is also characterized quite harshly by water scarcity and low precipitation. But although these regions are dry, they are not barren. 
they are productive landscapes for plants and animals, but they, certain, they certainly require our committed attention. Between climate variability, unsustainable land use, conflicts, and demographic shifts, we are seeing the continued degradation of these ecosystems. And these are areas that are facing unprecedented challenges, but at the same time hold enormous potential. They are sources for abundant soil energy. They do have a rich biodiversity within them. And there are countless opportunities to enhance the productivity and the resilience of production systems focused on dry lands. And I think this, where today's discussion comes fully into play, is where innovation has an opportunity to play a key role, to tap into these opportunities. And innovation can be the accelerator for the needed change, to scale up best practices um, and ultimately to reach more of an impact, but an impact at scale. FAO has a long history of supporting sustainable dryland agriculture around the world. We have contributed to the Great Green Wall Initiative in Africa to restore the continent's degraded landscapes. We have supported farmer field schools in Asia to the drylands of Mesoamerica to restore degraded drylands, working to increase crop productivity and ultimately enhance community and landscape resilience across these continents. And we also have initiatives such as the Grazing with Trees initiative. It integrates forestry and agricultural practices to restore dry lands while increasing local resilience against disasters and climate hazards. And alongside uh, UNEP, we are leading the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, an important opportunity to draw all of our attention to protecting and reviving ecosystems all around the world. And I think it too, being featured as a decade, gives us an opportunity to build a stronger, more broad-based global movement in support of dry lands and other important ecosystems. But we still have more to do. And I think that's where a conversation and a discussion like the one we're having today is so important. For our part uh, here at FAO, in just a few days, in fact, starting next Monday, we will be meeting and convening in FAO headquarters the 29th session of the FAO Committee on Agriculture. Or for those of you well familiar with FAO's nomenclature and acronyms, we call it COAG. Uh, COAG is one of four technical committees, uh, governing body process of FAO that provides guidance on agriculture related policies. We review global issues and trends, and we advise on emerging topics. And I believe this will also be an opportunity to continue building on this discussion, because in fact, it was back in 2020 uh, at the 27th session of COAG, where there was an endorsement by members of FAO's Global Program on Sustainable Dryland Agriculture demonstrating that dry lands are indeed a priority. So I hope that with today's discussion and with the bringing together of many of our partners, bringing together our members around these types of unique topics, that we can find ways to best use innovation, technologies, data, and other sustainable practices to really elevate and make the dry lands ecosystems of the planet far more resilient than they are today. So Yurdi, with that, I think I'll stop. Um, I'll turn it back over to you and I look forward very much to hearing from so many of our uh, partners who are here with us for the panel and for the discussion and um, also hopefully some very rich feedback and engagement from those of us who are joining us online. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Beth, for your encouraging welcome remarks and also for outlining the importance of the, you know, of dry lands some of our featured work on uh, dry lands and also you stress the importance of you know uh, working together and bringing the subject back to the table because of the important roles uh, for farmers and for the livelihood and also for food security so thank you so much beth uh, dear participants i see that we have hit uh, 200 participants i still invite you to introduce yourself where you are from I can see that you know some say good evening from the Philippines, from Indonesia, India, Yemen, 
so many things, Turkey. So please, you know, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Colleagues, um, we will set up the stage for this discussion um, by a message from a director of Land and Water Division of FAO, Mr. Li Feng Li, who is unfortunately due, due to other commitment cannot be with us, uh, but he has recorded his messages for us. So Hiko, could you kindly play the message from Director Li? Thank you. Dear Deputy Director General um, Bechtel, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to share a few points contributing, contributing to the discussion on resilient dry land at this seminar. You may recall that FA report, the status of land and water resources for food and agriculture 2021, concluded that the pressures on land and water resources are pushing the ecosystems to their productive limit, compromising agricultural production and intensifying poverty and malnutrition in all regions, especially in the fragile dry land areas. Over 95% of food is produced on land and it begins with the soils and water. We need to work together to produce more with less and safeguard these resources for the future. Desertification, land degradation and drought have increasing impacts on food security and the livelihoods of millions, negatively affect food production, water and soil resources, and increasing carbon emission and vulnerability to climate change. Estimates indicate that human-induced land degradation affect at least 1.6 billion hectares worldwide, impacting directly on 3.2 billion people. More than 60% of the human-induced land degradation is indeed taking place on agricultural lands, put the agri-food systems under unprecedented pressure. Drought is one of the most destructive natural disasters, severe drought, instance and becoming more frequent and affecting food security, especially in the dry areas and in countries with reduced capacity to absorb the shocks. By 2050, droughts may affect an estimated three quarters of the world population. It is a global issue. Together, we need to urgently shift the drought management paradigm, paradigm from reactive to proactive approaches to increase drought risk preparedness, strengthen adaptation capacity, and move away from emergency actions. The frequency and intensity of sand and dust storms, especially in arid and semi-arid regions, have increased over recent decades due to the land use, land cover changes, and climate factors, with many regions projected to experience increasing aridity aridity and drought frequency in, due to climate change. Sand and dust storms have a major transboundary impact on environment, cl climate, health, livelihood, agriculture and food security, and the social economic well-being of the society. Healthy soils are essential for sustainable and resilient agri-food systems as they provide a safe and nutritious food regulate both water and carbon cycles and support over uh, and support above the 60 percent of biodiversity on this planet long and short-term development and investment decisions addressing the restoration of degraded lands require integrated strategies that must consider soil organic carbon stocks soil recognition strategies can be a game changer towards towards achieving land degradation neutrality objectives. Land tenure security is necessary to encourage people to invest sustainably in their land to fight desertification, land degradation, and drought. And it's crucial to achieve land degradation neutrality. Supporting countries in dry areas to increase their resilience of livelihood and to reduce the impacts on vulnerable communities is at the heart of FAO's mandate. Sustainable land of water use and management is key to maintain and sustain food production and has to be at the heart of any agri-food system transformation. Integrated land use planning, responsible land governance and land tenure security and drought resilience are of fundamental importance for achieving 
food security, especially on the dry in the dry areas. The restoration of degraded agricultural land needs urgent, urgent political leadership, massive investment, and concerted actions on the ground. FAO will continue work with the countries and partners to combat desertification and drought to achieve food security and nutrition. With that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you a very productive discussion. Thank you very much, Li Feng, for setting the stage and context of our discussion today. I will move on uh, to the next speaker, uh, Ms. Jackie Hughes, the Director General of ICRISAT. Jackie will share research and development perspective with the title Critical Development and Opportunity for Dryland Agriculture. Jackie, over to you. Thank you very much, Yodi. And good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, DDG Beth, and the many colleagues and friends who have joined us on this webinar. I'm going to be talking about where the dry lands are, the main issues, the latest developments, and opportunities for the future, which is absolutely critical. Next, the dry lands. Yes, thank you. The dry lands, as Beth said, cover 40% of the Earth's surface, land surface. But the frightening fact is that it's 66% of Africa, 40% of Asia, and 24% of Europe are covered with dry lands, whether they are arid or semi-arid. Next. Although it is extremely dry and it's very difficult to get sufficient water, you will see that agricultural success happens. We have rain fed, we have highlands, lowlands, irrigated, but agricultural success is predicated around the successful management of water resources to achieve sustainable livestock, crop livestock, or crop crop system. Next. So looking at all these issues, um, productivity, we have heat and drought, we have soil degradation, we need inputs, we need fodder and feed, there are pests and diseases, we need pollinators, and an exceptional drought can cause huge yield losses. I mean, a truly exceptional drought, 100% loss, but an exceptional drought will give you about 70% loss of soybean, maize, wheat, rice. And as we heard just now, the dry lands are degraded and over a billion people in more than 100 countries are at risk. Climate change and climatic events, we're all seeing them. And we've got increased warming. We also have cooling, the rainfall, climatic events, changes in atmospheric CO2. And climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from 2030 to 2050 we must either mitigate or adapt. Looking at markets, market linkages in some of our arid areas are poor. We have asymmetrical access to information. We need digital tools, globalization, transportation. In Colombia, SMS weather information services reduce crop losses by 11 to 14%. Every incremental increase in production and harvest is important. We have labor and civil unrest. We've got aging farming communities. Agriculture isn't a preferred occupation anymore. Prohibitive labor costs, gender-related labor issues, civil unrest. And in my point of view, the first real climate change conflict took place in the Sahel in 2003 when the war in Darfur exposed how the convergence of environmental and political factors can lead to conflict. Policies got to be adapted to local needs and when adopted, they need to facilitate resilience and productivity, must be fit for purpose and you've got to manage trade-offs. Capacity development has to be properly determined, correctly implemented. And you have to address the needs of the different segments of communities, the farmers, the production systems. 
because communities with lower levels of adaptive capacity experience higher climate, in, climate impacts due to their reduced ability to cope with climate change. Next. There have been developments. It's not all a bad set of stories here, but the landscape approach, we need to be holistic, looking at the watersheds perhaps. We've got to have drought heat tolerant varieties that will survive and yield. We've had a greater focus on the dry lands, think, thanks to the International Year of Millets and then the G20 in India, but we have to continue. That was just the beginning. We need the crops to be nutritious. Biofortified crops exist. Sometimes there's enough food, but it's not good nutrition. We're harvesting water is the dry lands and more than 70% of the area of the Indian semi-arid tropics has high to medium potential for implementing rainwater harvesting, but we don't always do it. For our soil, we've been putting in a lot of inputs, but not in the dry lands. And one size solution, such as regenerative agriculture, it doesn't fit all. Glass houses and hydroponics are a possibility for the high value crops, which can be grown in dry lands. Um, you see them grown in the deserts of Saudi Arabia and so on, protected cultivation, but high value crops. Next. We now understand better physiology and productivity. We know about root architecture, for example, and canopy structure. We know that if we get increased light penetration to lower canopy, we can increase yields by up to 17% in some crops. We've got to minimize risk to farmers by diversifying. We need to use digital ag. But the information has to be not only available, it has to be transparent. And when we use machine learning, we have to make sure that what is produced by us is correct, usable, fit for purpose. We need to facilitate breeding, whether it's um, through genomics or other molecular tools. We know how to do it but the policies and the regulatory environment is not always supportive. Speed breeding works, conventional breeding, six generations a year for some crops now. So that helps. And we know we need partnerships, but we need better partnerships, stronger, sustainable partnerships. Next, because I put it to you, even however hard we try, are we going to be able to meet the goals that we have set ourselves? And the figures that we're seeing, it's not looking good, particularly for the dry land. Next. There are opportunities, though. This is the great part. Um, one of the things we need, though, is increased funding. That is critical for research. Agriculture doesn't get enough funding to start with compared to, example, medicine. But we need more for the dry lands. I'll come on to the health and nutrition aspect, but for soils, we'll hear more about soils, but farmers always overestimate the sizes of their farms. They've been putting too much on their farms when they could afford or even find the inputs. Let's make sure that we target the recommendations very carefully. Um, the diagnostic tools that we have for targeted advisories, we, we can do things like traceability, um, using machine learning, we can add value to products. Uh, capacity development, it needs to be done not nationally, but globally, continental, regional, because if you're limited by a country or a specific group of people, the interactions aren't there and you don't get the full benefit of the capacity development. If we look at digital ag, there are so many opportunities, whether you're using satellites, drones, or any other type of technology, but it's got to be available to everyone and the information has to be true. Next. 
I was talking about the holistic approach to health, nutrient-rich food. We're looking at soil microbiomes. We're looking at plant microbiomes, gut microbiomes, the interactions and synergies using big data. We can use AI, and we need to understand the relationships between them that lead to good health. When we have biofortified crops, which I was talking about earlier, make sure that the nutrients are bioavailable. They are not always. We need to know how to prepare the food. Um, make sure that even when we breed the plants, it will be a bioavailable nutrient. We need dietary diversity. It's a very simple thing. Have diversity on your plate. We've been talking about it for years. It's not happening. How do we do it? And however much we do for one health, we need also to minimize chronic infections that prevent uptake of nutrients. We don't do it all together. We do it bit by bit. We need to pull it all together. If we could go on to the next slide, please. I'm talking about, about gene editing on this, this slide. It's becoming more popular. In some countries, for example, India, there's a simple regulatory environment for gene edited crops, not transgenic crops. And for intractable problems, gene editing can solve rancidity in pearl millet flour, might solve aflatoxins. And if countries still cannot accept gene edited plants because somebody might think it's scary, at least then we will know exactly what we're looking for in gene banks, in the diversity of our crops to use conventional breeding. So don't write off gene editing if you think the regulatory environment won't permit it. It's an amazing tool and we need to use it quickly. Next, other opportunities include crop management, Big advances in productivity are needed, and we need to get our options right. We need to have the management options absolutely spot on. I'll talk about adaptation. Pests and diseases are really um, taking off with climate change. We we can use remote sensing apps to identify and track and control, but it needs to be done on a holistic level just controlling one field is not good enough. You've got to control a landscape to stop the spread of pests and diseases. We can help uh, increase availability of nitrogen in the soil using biological nitrification inhibition. Again, technology driven, but it would help. We can... Um, advocate the use of new technologies, gene editing, for example, but scientists are not the ones to do that advocacy very well. We don't do it well. We need others to help support us. And some of these crops used for the dry lands have industrial uses. Yes, we want food, we want nutrition, but money is also important. So let's not forget that. And I believe we should foster entrepreneurship opportunities. That's a way of getting the youth back in. Um, and we can scale and deliver impact, which is what we're all about. Next. I mentioned crop adaptation and selection. I put it to you all that we can no longer breed crops for today. We have to breed crops for maybe 10 to 15 years ahead. Why are we forcing crops which love a semi-temperate climate? Why are we trying to breed them forcefully to the drylands? The drylands are expanding. As the, we reach the edges, why not put in crops that are adapted? Why give ourselves such a huge headache trying to adapt crops that don't like those environments? Our crops need to be tolerant of climatic events, abiotic stresses and broad-based resistance to pests and diseases, but we have to get it all together in one plant, not as separate traits. Next, and please, can we work at a landscape approach? We need watershed level approaches. We need to manage water. Water is owned, it's used for irrigation. 
fisheries, for drinking, and it's a cause of conflict. We need to have the cereals, the legumes, the horticulture, the trees, diversify the cropping system. We have the tools we need. Data is plentiful, it's available. And there are many opportunities. We need effective policies to though, to be able to implement them. I've given you a whole mishmash of all the things that are wrong and all the ways that we could work together, but we have to work at scale. Individual farms won't fix the problem. It has to be done across scale. So I hope it's given you a taste and I'm looking forward to hearing if anybody has the solutions that we can take further. Thank you very much, everyone. Jackie, thank you very much for this succinct but comprehensive presentation from you. Very well received and I think very critical. Many of what you said are very relevant, if not all. Uh, and thanks, you know, Jackie, for really bringing these important issues, new developments, opportunities. Yes, we have challenges, but as you said, we need to work at scale and at landscape level. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, colleagues, for those of who, you who have just joined, you can start now asking questions in the Q&A chat. Um, we will continue to the next presenters. Our own uh, Makiko Taguchi will be sharing uh, our work on dry land from FAO perspective. Makiko, over to you. Thank you very much, Yurdi. Hello, everyone. My name is Makiko Taguchi. I'm an agricultural officer with the Plant Production and Protection Division. I hope you're seeing my slide okay? Perfectly, yes. Great. So I have the honor to, to share briefly about what our division, Plant Production Protection Division, is doing in the drylands uh, alongside other partners. So the first um, program that I want to mention is the Dryland Sustainable Landscapes uh, Initiative uh, Impact Program, which uh, I think flows nicely after what Jackie just mentioned, that we really need to work at the landscape level. So this impact program is funded by the Global Environmental Facility and led by FAO and has started in 2021 and until 2026. Let's see. So the program is working uh, in various forms, uh, supporting 11 countries in Africa and Central Asia. One of the ways is, is through this sustainable landscape production framework, which addresses common management challenges in drylands through an integrated multi-sectoral approach, and then breaking silos for greater impact by shifting from fragmented interventions to a cohesive model through farmer field schools and ac improving access to seeds through community seed banks and um, business incubation through forest and farm facility. The other element is the integrated landscape assessment methodology. As Jackie just mentioned, data is available. So through this uh, methodology, we bring together data from geospatial information systems such as Google Earth and down to household level data so that uh, tailored uh, evidence-based interventions can be made. And these are, are shared and lessons learned are, are shared through a regional um, exchange mechanisms and also uh, through these community of practices that are set up who are dealing with the data, but also with the production framework. And this is all supported not only by our division, but of course with the land and water division that Mr. Lee shared, and also uh, the forestry division. Going a little bit deeper into the community seed bank element that our seeds and genetic resources team is supporting. This element is supporting six countries from the SADC region in fo focusing on the Miombo and the Mopane woodlands area in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this uh, community seed banks are set up to help mitigate the negative effects of land degradation and to help a regional approach through the regional uh, exchange mechanism, like I mentioned. And then 
creating a, a sustainable and a scalable action through the coordination with the SADAC Plant Genetic Resources Center. And it is also supported by uh, international platforms such as inter in International Treaty of Plant Genetic Resources, which is also hosted by FAO. And this work is really focusing on diversification that Jackie had just mentioned. It's, all, it's about availability of quality seed through the community banks, uh, seed banks, making uh, available the well-adapted crops and varieties that some of them might be traditional, but because of, of lack of, of investments, they may have kind of disappeared from the cultures. Helping uh, farmers to diversify cropping systems and overall to improve productivity and to have a diverse and balanced diet and helping farmers participate in new value chains. So in, in that community seed bank uh, initiative also supported the International Year of Millets that we celebrated last year that Jackie also mentioned. Uh, millets is a, a one of the or group of crops that are, are suited for dryland environments. So throughout the year we have celebrated not only just these 15 types of millets, uh, but um, various millets even beyond these to really focus on the, the, the traditions and the cultures and the cuisines that have supported communities all around the world. And I am happy to inform you that the final report has just been published today. So you can visit the final report of the International Year of Millets and the link that is provided in the chat and in the slide that you see. I would also like to bring attention to an FAO ICARTA International Technical Cooperation Network on Cactus that I've been working on for the last decade. This community is working on, on really bringing together research and development in cactus. It's a crop. Dopuntia species is the main species, but not only that this group focuses on, originates in Mexico, but now it's grown in, in all over the world in the dryland areas. We currently have not over 900 members in 79 countries. And the, the really uh, interesting thing about this crop is that it's, or groups of crops, is that they're very resilient. Of course, they're cactus. They, they thrive well in dryland areas. And they are versatile. They are good for human consumption as the fruits or the pads of salads or vegetables. And as for fodder, it's, it's an increasing crop that is um, recognized as a good source of fodder. And it is also a good source of bioenergy is getting, gaining a lot of interest around the world. And next year, we'll be working with our partners, Sicarda and others, to support the International Congress on Cacti as food, fodder, and other uses in uh, Spain. So please uh, let me know if you are interested in this work as well. And then on top of this, I would also like to mention that we have been working in support of the U.S. State Department and the African Union on the vision for adaptive crops and soils, or, or known as VACs for some of you. And this is an, an in initiative that brings attention to indigenous and traditional crops that we have, some of them we have just mentioned, Jackie and I, that are more adapted uh, to the local environmental conditions and nutritious, uh, that can be more nutritious than other uh, major staple crops that are grown in, in the countries. And they have, they are, tend to be more climate uh, resilient and also um, better adapted to land degradation. So as Jackie just mentioned, it is important that these uh, um, neglected and underutilized species um, get the attention they need for research and development, as well as policy and investment attention. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Makiko. Uh, I can see the a lot of convergence between what you presented and that of Jackie's. It's good, you know, to see how you know um, uh, we are working, you know, at country level, at landscape level, to promote uh, to promote the drylands. Um, so for sure, you know, uh, as Jackie said, and also Beth said, 
you know, we need to be working together on this. You know, I already see, you know, from these two presentation, how important it, it is for us to compare notes and to move together uh, to support dryland agriculture. Uh, thank you again, Makiko. Now I would like to move on to our next presenters who will present managing soil health and plant nutrition in dryland ecosystem in Sub-Saharan Africa. It is my honor to invite uh, Sami Zingore, the Director of Research at African Plant Nutrition Institute. Sami, over to you. Sami, are you with us? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see it, but maybe you need to put it in presentation mode. Now it's good. It's okay now. Go ahead. Oh, excellent. Uh, thank you very much um, for the introduction and um, greetings to colleagues and partners joining us uh, from um, different parts of uh, the world. It's a great pleasure for me to be part of this uh, very important and um, timely discussion on sustainable management of uh, uh, livelihoods and landscapes in the drylands. And I'm going to focus uh, my presentation today on issues related to the intricate connection between soil health and plant nutrition with the primary focus in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I wanted to start by illustrating the core um, intricate uh, relationship between nutrient management and some of the environmental and um, social and economic uh, sustainability challenges that uh, we encounter in the region. At the apex of uh, the challenges for agricultural sustainability in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, the low and inappropriate nutrient application. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa currently is the lowest use of both organic and um, mineral fertilizers, resulting in um, a soil health crisis that is associated with nutrient mining, with currently more than 30 kgs of nutrients being lost from agricultural lands on the continent. And there's also the um, parallel uh, challenges associated with overgrazing that also deplete uh, the overall biomass and nutrients in the system. Over the long term, this cascades into um, land degradation, uh, which at this point, 65% uh, of the cropland in the African dryland is actually uh, considered to be degraded, uh, resulting in major um, you know, challenges and high risk for non-responsive source that don't respond to management. And um, this then is associated with a whole host of other environmental uh, challenges, including um, high emissions of carbon uh, from uh, and, and biodiversity losses, mostly through area expansion, uh, especially into vulnerable drylands uh, that then trigger a lot of uh, climate, um, you know, change and exacerbate the effect of climate change as well. And this then is uh, expressed in the major food uh, and nutritional and livelihood challenges that we find on the continent. So what I'm going to address today is uh, to highlight the importance then of building soil health and systems resilience with a key focus on addressing the core issue of plant nutrition and um, focusing on integrated soil fertility, crop and water management, and then ensuring that this is done to address climate change and then also the, um, address uh, the context specific technologies due to the diversity of the um, systems that we are working in in uh, the um, different parts of the continent. But we also need to add, pay attention to the economic viability of uh, the solutions, because in large parts, uh, a lot of technologies that work, uh, um, you know, from a technical perspective, are not always providing the right solutions that uh, meet the socioeconomic uh, requirements of smallholder farmers. I wanted to... Uh, provide an illustration here of um, studies that we've carried out in the drylands in East and Southern Africa, looking at the impact of low input systems on soil carbon. And soil carbon is used as a good indicator of soil health due to its multiple uh, functions. 
uh, for um, uh, biological, physical, and uh, chemical soil properties. In a large part of the systems under smallholder low input system, soil organic matter declines very rapidly in the initial years of cultivation, reaching um, in um, about 10 years to less than 50% of the initial soil organic carbon uh, stored in uh, native um, uh, woodlands or grasslands. And what is uh, very striking is that uh, a large part of the carbon losses, which is also associated with land degradation, okay, in the initial years of cultivation and resulting in very low crop productivity with yields uh, only in the range of one to two tons per hectare. And land degradation results in soils that respond very poorly to management. And this is a key challenge. Uh, whilst in large parts of the world, soil health issues are related to intensification and overuse of uh, um, pesticides um, and, and fertilizers. It's a, a, a contrasting situation in large parts of the southern Africa where a large part of the land degradation is driven by low use of nutrient inputs. But what we also found interesting is uh, by investing in um, new plant nutrition uh, by uh, investing in balanced fertilization with uh, managing crop residues to improve soil organic carbon. Um, in commercial farming systems, uh, we observed that uh, we could actually double the soil organic carbon in the long term and maintain much higher yields, highlighting the core value of plant nutrition in improving soil health and also contributing to sustainable crop production as well. Then I just wanted to then illustrate um, some of the um, processes of land degradation and how they relate to crop response and plant nutrition. Um, the degradation and restoration trajectories associated with crop productivity happen in a sequential process. Uh, in large parts of the systems, uh, an early part of the degradation is associated with nutrient losses. And under such conditions in the A zone, we can actually improve crop productivity by uh, focusing on plant nutrition as a key component of increasing pro crop productivity. And by investing in plant nutrition, we also produce the biomass that is needed to maintain ISO organic matter and soil health. But as degradation advances and you, you have uh, chemical and biological degradation taking place, then the uh, responsiveness of the soils are diminished and the rate of restoration is also diminished. And in those systems, a greater focus on integrated solutions becomes pertinent. But under advanced uh, degradation conditions, a way I want to highlight in the zone C, uh, this is where degradation is very severe and nutrition itself does not solve the challenge because soils become low responsive to nutrient applications. And under those conditions, soil health restoration becomes in the key entry point. And this is where a large part of the efforts in regenerative agriculture and some of the nature-based solutions that are needed first to rebuild soil health before the source can respond to nutrient applications becomes the key entry point for reversing productivity. Then I just wanted to uh, end by highlighting that uh, we have been working in this conceptual frameworks, uh, addressing the critical need of plant nutrition, both in terms of mineral fertilizers and organics to support the continental agricultural development agenda. And we are proud as a PNI to have uh, contributed in a leading role in the development of the Africa Union um, Fertilizer and Soil Health Action Plan, which was endorsed by the African governments at the summit in Nairobi this year. This creates uh, the priorities and such the priorities of the continent for sustainable soil health uh, and uh, plant nutrition and crop productivity for the next decade. It's a 10 year action plan. And the action plan focuses on harnessing multi-stakeholder partnerships and investments for sustainable fertilizer and soil health management. And four key intervention areas are covered in that action plan, which um, will direct uh, innovation and investments uh, through multiple partnerships in addressing the challenges of soil health in the continent. A large part of what I talked about today is an outcome three, greater efficiency, resilience, and sustainable use of mineral and organic fertilizer inputs. But this is done in the 
uh, enabling environment of improve, improved policies, investments, finances, and markets to ensure that access to the right technologies is enabled, and then also improved access and affordability of the organic and mineral fertilizers, which overcomes one big barrier of access and affordability. And then also, we need to also pay attention to the institutional and human capacity uh, development uh, needs to be able to drive the innovation and promote the scaling and um, the um, adop adoption of the uh, plant nutrition strategies that are site-specific, crop-specific, but also fitting the social economic context of small order farmers. I wanted to end uh, this uh, highlight of uh, the continental agenda and um, will be pleased to further discuss uh, some of the key specific technologies um, as we will have time for discussion later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sami, for your very interesting presentations, and I congratulate you for putting this together. In view of time, you know, I will move on to the next presenter, Ms. Tomoko Harigaya, Chief Scientist, Precision Development, uh, who will talk about digital agricultural innovations to foster climate resilient smallholder system. Over to you, Tomoko. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, and you know, I very much appreciate the opportunity to share our learnings with all of you today. Um, so as you know, the spread of mobile phones and you know, new technologies and data present a huge opportunity to disseminate and de deliver customized information to smallholder farmers in real time in a way that's really unprecedented. Uh, and today, you know, I'd like to bring in kind of implementers' perspective to the discussion. And, and share you know, how we have approached to, to take advantage of these technologies, uh, digital, you know, digital tools, um, and share some of our experience uh, in India. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll start with a quick introduction of precision development or PXD. For those of you who aren't familiar with our work, we are a nonprofit working with the government and other partners to expand access to innovations and information that millions of farmers can use to improve their livelihoods. And digital agricultural advisory has been a core part of our work. Um, so we work flexibly with the different partners depending on the needs in each context. So sometimes we take on the implementer role, um, designing and de delivering customized information directly to smallholder farmers. But we also work with partners to make data-driven improvements to already existing digital services. Or in some other settings, we take on the advisory role for the government, you know, trying to integrate digital technologies into agriculture extension. Next slide, please. And over the years, you know, we've really focused on building customized information services for smallholder farmers that are sustainable at a very large scale. Um, and our general approach is to combine farmer-specific information and available agricultural data in a given context. Um, and then we create localized and dynamic information that enables farmers to optimize their agricultural decisions. Um, for instance, you know, you might have a farmer location, crop profile, um, and then so forth from farmers uh, that you're working with. And then you might have agricultural data, you know, in a specific context. Some, sometimes, you know, so, so health data, uh, there might be better forecasts, market prices, and so forth. Um, you know, usually you don't have all of this data in place at the start. And this is something that you build out as you interact more with farmers and learn about the context of available data. Uh, next slide, please. And then one important element of, of our work is really to kind of create this feedback loop that allows the service to iterate in, and improve over time. And there are a few key elements to this. Uh, first one is that we use behavioral science and the human-centered design approach to ensure that farmers we are targeting find the advisory messages relevant and actionable. Uh, especially with agricultural advice or even things like weather forecasts, messages can get quite technical and hard to understand, especially in short messages. So this is something we pay a lot of attention to. 
Second, we use the experiment and other methods of data analysis to continuously test the design tweaks to increase engagement and adoption. And then third, we set out every service with the scaling partners, um, open governments, so that we can rapidly reach you know, hundreds of thousands of farmers and keep the service free, free to them. And then there's a sustainable path. Um, and the scale, of course, you know, also means that you gain kind of more data access and that allows you to learn faster and increase impact faster as well. All right, next slide, please. So now, like, how does all of this look like in action? I'll take one example today uh, from India work again. So PXD's flagship program, uh, which is called Amakrushi. So this is a two-way voice platform where farmers receive customized agricultural device on their mobile phones as recorded messages. And then they can also call in and record a question to get an answer from a government agronomist within you know, 48 hours or you know, two to three days, essentially. Uh, and in addition to agronomic advice, you know, farmers also receive real-time alerts uh, on extreme weather events or you know, local pest conditions where the information was available. Uh, the service was co-designed with the government of Orissa and co-funded by the government and the Gates Foundation. But the vision for sustainable model was very clear from the start among all stakeholders that PXD would, you know, first build and improve the service. Um, and then, you know, that's again about gathering farmer feedback, tweaking messages or creating a dashboard and other tools to help the government monitor usage over time, right? And then uh, uh, we transitioned the service to the government fully after five years. Uh, but this was all planned. So when we handed over the service with nearly 3 million farmers on the platform in 2022, we also handed over an operational team that was already familiar with the, the flow and managing the service for a while. And really, the, I think the remarkable thing was, you know, the government was... Uh, uh, because of all that planning and, and kind of steps in place, it, they were ready to take it and run with it. After you know the transition, they continue to expand the service, and now it's reaching over 6 million farmers, covering, I think, over 20 value chains now. Next slide, please. And then in the process of this you know, scaling of the service, we also incorporated a randomized evaluation to measure the impact of the service among rice farmers. Today, I'm just touching on a few preliminary findings and insights. Um, so first, uh, looking at the usage, we saw a fairly high and consistent engagement over two years. And then second, you know, we see a significant increase in total rice production. In particular, a large impact appears to be concentrated among farmers in areas hit by certain types of weather shocks. So for example, in the first year of the evaluation, there was this concentrated heavy rainfall that submerged plants in the middle of the season. The analysis seems to suggest that access to Amakrushi substantially increased total production among those farmers. And then very excitingly, we also see a large reduction in the reported likelihood of severe crop loss due to weather related events. And this figure you know, comes from actually the second year where actually the, the, the big shock was actually the scarcity of rainfall. So you know, this, this part of the, the geography, they get both too much rain and too little rain. And we seem to, to see that the, the you know, generally the evaluation suggests that advisory was helpful in farmers coping with these different types of weather shocks. Um, three insights that you know, I just want to quickly highlight. First is that these results seem to suggest that there's, there is a very large amount of need for climate information uh, for, for smallholder farmers to, to cope with these weather-related events. Second, you know, we know that different farmers face different shocks and constraints across seasons and who benefit from the service and by how much will likely change from season to season. So we might see a large impact in only a small subset of farmers in a particular year, but that doesn't mean that the shell advisory won't be helpful for other farmers in a different year. So, so I think that kind of changes the way we think about maybe impact measurement and, and, and so forth. And then lastly, I think to enable farmers to improve their climate resilience, we see a big opportunity, again, with all these new technologies and data, to improve our capabilities to identify the most relevant localized climate risks um, in real time. 
Next slide, please. <laughs> now I'll wrap, wrap up with just a few thoughts on the replicability of these types of digital agricultural advisory services. So first, um, you know, one challenge we faced is the difficulty of aligning donors and the government's interest at the same time. So for instance, you know, the government might express enthusiasm, um, but it takes time to kind of identify funding opportunity um, and then so forth. So by then, there may be changes in the government or the government may be busy with something else to kind of collaborate on a, on a proposal in a month. Um, and, and that, you know, I, I think that we really find ourselves to, to kind of find these big opportunities lost because of these challenges of aligning, you know, all the, the stakeholders at the same time. Second, once you do have an opportunity to set up a digital agricultural advisory service with the government, it's really important to integrate the service into the existing government infrastructure. Um, you know, this can enhance collaboration, buy-in, and knowledge transfer, which is absolutely necessary to make the service sustainable. And then third, systems and data, systems and data processes that can create a feedback loop are critical to maintaining the impact at scale. As we scale and expand our target farmer base, we have to ensure that the content continues to be relevant for more diverse farmer needs and environments. And this requires constant, you know, farmer feedback and iterations. And I think one way that we think about it is, uh, you know, when we are setting up these feedback mechanisms, we are reducing communication frictions between farmers and governments and scientists and, you know, all the stakeholders. And I think that's a, a really important piece. Um, and then finally, I think a part of this creating an effective feedback system is about establishing a culture of experimentation and learning. Um, I think the return to institutionalizing this type of feedback mechanisms and the, a culture of experimentation can generate very large sustainable impact. Um, of course, we haven't really figured out how to do all of this, uh, and we are constantly learning, and I'd love to hear from other panelists and the audience about you know, their experience in scaling innovations and services to small farmers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Makiko, for your interesting presentation on you know how digital innovation you know can play its role in 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 our discussion. Very interesting, and uh, I, I I congratulate you for this presentation and for keeping it within the time. Now I would like to move on to our next presenter, who will be talking about promoting entrepreneurship and agri-food innovations in the dry land. It's my honor to invite uh, Mr. Temi Adegoroye, Managing Partner, Shahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition. Temi, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you can you see my screen and hear me? Yes. Okay? yes. Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon from Kano, Nigeria. Um, good evening, good morning to you all, uh, depending on where you are. Um, Antemi Adigure has introduced I head Sahel Consulting, a consulting firm focused on transforming the food and agriculture landscape across Africa. And how we're speaking uh, on promoting entrepreneurship and agri-food innovations in drylands, uh, focusing on Africa. Uh, just to quickly, um, you know, mention that, I mean, it's a reminder that uh, Africa is not really endowed for agricultural excellence. And uh, we know why. Um, about 50 to 70 percent of the population is involved in agriculture uh well 80 percent of the food they produced uh being produced by by farmers small-scale producers and we have about 60 percent of the world arable land uh, but of course we know uh, some of the issues we're facing with dry land agriculture and you know uh the significance of, of dry land agriculture now to make to ensure that uh, we make dry land agriculture uh more resilient more, more sustainable um, I want to speak today highlighting three uh, ways to three critical ways uh, to promote entrepreneurship and agri-food innovations uh, in dry lands. The first would be focused on uh, empowering SMEs uh, in agriculture to build resilience against shocks of climate. Uh, the second would be scaling up uh, private sector engagements with, with smaller farmers and the third will be promoting market-led initiatives. Um, 
we uh, we are currently uh, implementing a program uh, called the Building Resilience Against Climate Sh Climate and Environmental Shocks uh, Brace, uh, which basically is focused on uh, intensive capacity development um, to support Afri African agricultural SMEs uh, to become aware of how the businesses are affected by climate change and you know enabling them to develop strategies to mitigate mitigate them. Uh, it's quite in it's quite um, uh, a very intensive program. Over 1,200 SMEs across 30 countries in Africa uh, have been trained. And we're beginning to see increased uh, business efficiency uh, of these agribusinesses. At least about 30% of them are beginning to adopt climate smart agricultural practices. Um, on the next slide, I wanted to highlight um, if some some of the um, some of some some part of the data diagnostics uh, coming out of the training. And really to say, uh, you can see how the knowledge of country level uh, climate smart agriculture uh, policies uh, have increased up to almost over 90% just uh, from, from the training activities, uh, as well as the knowledge of, of climate uh, smart agriculture approaches. Many of the participants actually didn't even know or were not aware of any uh, climate smart agriculture practices uh, pre, pre the training. And uh, it's quite encouraging to see that, and uh, I can I can you know say that many of these trained agri SMEs are beginning to adopt uh, various practices uh, in their businesses uh, in the drylands. Uh, and just to before moving on on this slide to highlight that uh, I think addressing climate shocks in drylands uh, should start with increasing the knowledge of the key value chain actors. Very important uh, businesses or, or small scale producers. Um, Moving on, the second I want to highlight here really is scaling private sector engagement with, with smaller farmers. And I, I think if we're going to promote entrepreneurship, um, you know, promote agri-food innovations in, in the drylands, we need to encourage many of the private sector partners that are playing in that space. Um, and there are quite a number of uh, unique, innovative business models that many private organizations have explored. Um, with uh, uh, explored, you know, ranging from uh, informal engagement between uh, entrepreneurs and smallholder farmers or intermediary, uh, where they, they sign formal, you know, contracts where we have formal subcontracting of companies, and 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 aggregators, farmer groups, um, you know, to engage farmers to 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 directly, you know, offtake their produce or you know, more centralized models or nucleus estate model where these companies are, you know, setting up farms and engaging farmers there. But the unique thing about these private sector engagement uh, models is that uh, many of the critical services that small scale producers require in dry land uh, come with these service provision models, uh, you know, providing sustainable ecosystem for the farmers, uh, providing access to input services, training, uh, ensuring the effective monitoring system, providing mechanization support, storage support. And uh, the, the most important of all is you know, the fact that there is market access. Uh, uh, and these models are, are becoming more and more prominent uh, on the continent, especially in, in dry lands across several value chains. And I think uh, one of the ways to encourage, uh, you know, agribusinesses um, working in this, in this space is to really supports the scaling efforts uh, in ensuring that many more value chains are reached and many more small scale producers are, are reached as well. And of course, uh, more uh, food is produced. This uh, is something that I think is very important. Um, the third uh, initiative that I would highlight uh, a way that I think we need to, that we, we can explore to uh, promote entrepreneurship and agri-food innovation is by promoting uh, market-led initiatives. And there, are, there are several of them, but I, I want to highlight uh, one called the Advancing Local Dairy Development in Nigeria program that is uh, currently being led by Sahel Consulting. Uh, robust, uh, com com complex program, uh, leveraging ecosystem uh, model or methods to address the issues within the dairy uh, sector in Nigeria, but not just addressing the issues within the dairy sector, like ensuring that uh, we are, uh, you know, creating or building more uh, entrepreneurial capacity within rural communities, uh, uh, in both dairy and non-dairy communities. 
uh, so far, the Howdin program has uh, been able to form about uh, form farmers into about two thousand six hundred sixty seven self help groups. Uh, you know, formed into two, two, over two hundred cooperatives. Now we have more than eleven thousand women that are trained on different entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, business models uh, ranging from you know poultry, goat rearing, uh, vegetable cultivation, uh, soap making, petroleum jelly. And you can see some of the numbers there, how these women have been able to, um, through collaboration with uh, private sector uh, dairy processors, have uh, been able to sell milk worth over 2 million USD uh, in the last uh, three and a half years. And uh, within the program, we've been able to also train more than 200 community-based entrepreneurs uh, who are providing various you know, degree of services uh, as Artificial insemination technicians, vets, community-based animal husbandry service, provi uh, service providers. These, I think, um, you know, has created a unique uh, business uh, business pathway within communities, and you know, helping farmers to to uh, really you know increase income. And uh, just to highlight uh, what that is looking like in terms of income diversification for women, we can see uh, some two women groups here that I highlighted um, in. Both Kano and Adamawa, Nigeria, with uh, income diversification training, they're beginning to really uh, explore, uh, you know, poultry businesses, and we're beginning to see that these businesses are becoming sustainable because uh, it's they, they've not just done it one off; they they, they continue to reinvest, um, you know, their profit and plow plow back into uh, actually doing more. Uh, this for us, we believe, so is a success story that um, if we support these kind of initiatives, uh, we definitely can do more in dry lands. The, the other one is uh, around uh, nutrition, uh, education, vegetable gardening, and how uh, training women uh, and men on the principles of dietary diversity and supporting them to actually create gardens have led to not just uh, ensuring that they have food for their households, but they also have uh, vegetables to sell and they're making uh, money at, at the community level. It also just shows that uh, if we scale several market-led initiatives like this one, uh, we are uh, likely going to be able to achieve a lot more uh, in you know encouraging entrepreneurship in, in dry lands and, and ensuring food uh, availability. Um, it's this is my last slide. I just want to end by uh, specifically highlighting some very practical steps that I think we need to consider in addition to those three initiatives. I think we need to support agri-food entrepreneurs to scale successful private sector-led initiatives. I talked about some backward integration uh, models uh, between private sector and, 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 and farmers, uh, service provision models uh, as well. Um, we need to leverage infrastructure to harness the dryland, uh, some of the most important dryland resources. And I think, I mean, solar energy comes to mind. Uh, uh, I mean, we can harness the power of solar energy in drylands to power agriculture and power other sectors in Africa. And I think that would definitely bring a lot more development to the, to, into the drylands. And I think we need to support the creation of um, a, a pan African policy platform for. Uh, a coordinated voice on, on how to develop drylands. I think that's has become uh, critical now more than ever before. Uh, we need to empower entrepreneurs to build resilience against climate shocks. Um, with the little we can achieve on race, I believe that with more uh, education around climate and support, I believe that many entrepreneurs will, would emerge from within the drylands. And of course, the the final, the final one would be the creation of a knowledge sharing hub. I think data uh, is extremely important, and knowledge exchange, information exchange is, is very critical for business decision making and uh, you know evidence program design and implementation. Um, I, I will stop there and uh, I'll wait for the question uh, and answer session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Temi, for sharing your uh, experience on this. And uh, nice to see how this entrepreneurship aspect, entrepreneurship aspect in 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 your work and in 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 sub-Saharan Africa. In view of time, uh, I will move on to our final presenters. Um, I would like to invite Marcela Lemus de Roche, uh, who is uh, from FAO El Salvador. She will be talking about climate 
building climate resilient landscapes through local knowledge and innovation in Central America's dry corridor. Marcela, over to you. Thank you very much, Jordi, and hello to all the audience that is joining us today uh, from all over the world. My name is Marcela Lemus, and I am a specialist in resilient agriculture for the Green Climate Fund Project Reclima in FAO El Salvador. And I'm very grateful uh, to share on behalf of the Reclima team uh, our experience in building climate resilient landscapes through sustainable agriculture measures. So to start with our presentation, I will talk a little bit about the dry corridor in Central America, which it covers 44% of Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. And as you can see, we are located in El Salvador and the country is within the, the region. Uh, however, the Reclima project is on 108 districts uh, which were selected through uh, those territories having high and severe drought. Uh, communities within the dry corridor are severely affected by climate change events, uh, mainly for long periods of drought followed by intense rains and also land degradation. And we have talked also, uh, another panelists have talked also about water scarcity in the region affecting crops, animal production and human consumption. Unfortunately, we still have unsustainable management practices in agricultural production, which leads to an inadequate management of natural resources, especially soil and water. So under this context, we have the upscaling climate resilient measures in the dry corridor agroecosystems of El Salvador, better known as Reclima Project, which was formulated in 2018, and it is financed by the Green Climate Fund and the Salvadorian, the Salvadorian government and FIAES for a total of $127.6 million. The project aims to uh, increase the resilience of the livelihoods of the population living in the dry corridor to climate change. And this is aligned with the objective of the Global Program on Sustainable Dryland Agriculture, which aims to empower small scale producers by building technical uh, capacities to protect natural resources under a changing climate. Uh, the project has three main outputs. The first one aims to improve the resilience of the livelihoods and production systems in family farms. The second one uh, is more related with the restoration processes of critical areas such as water recharge zones, riparian zones, buffer zones of natural protected areas in order to increase the resilience of flows of environmental services at landscape levels. And finally, we have output number three, which aims to improve the governance and information flow in support of sustainability and scaling up. Basically, this output is, this, is the foundation of the sustainability of outputs one and two. But for today's presentation, we will focus on output number one, where we are applying an innovative approach in terms of capacity building and agricultural extension methodology. We are working with farmers field schools, but using a figure of a community promoter who is a leader farmer within their communities and they are selected under certain criteria. We have technical staff facilitating these farmer field schools with these community promoters. After that, uh, community promoters replicate the knowledge with a group of farmers within their communities. In average, each community promoters have um, 35 farmers. And that's why, as you can see, by 2024, we have achieved more than 46,000 farmers already, because I think that we all uh, or mainly in the, in, 
in, in the old countries, we have uh, a lack of human resources. However, we are creating capacities of these people, uh, not just to building uh, capacities, but also to provide technical assistance. Within the farmers, we have the participation of women, youth, and indigenous people. And we have achieved already more than 41,000 hectares where farmers are applying at least two sustainable practices. So which are the key implemented strategies that we are implementing to transform dryland agriculture? Where first of all, we have the traditional knowledge. We have a validation of the sustainable practices with indigenous peoples and other key actors. And actually, indigenous peoples were very happy that we were rescuing some of these practices. As we will see, they are not new. And people stop doing them. Obviously for you, the use of products or other technology that is not that are not environmentally friendly um, but facilitates the work uh, for them. Another important strategy is the governance and institutional strengthening. And here we are working with uh, local committees that are integrated by local governments, NGOs, a community based organization, among another key actors. And this is actually one of the things that have motivated producers to implement the practices as well, because, for example, in some ter territories, we have local governments supporting uh, producers with additional inputs or technical assistance. And at the same time, local governments can comply with environmental regulations within their territories, for example, with uh, the nut burning uh, in the agricultural areas. Another important thing is technology and the use of digital tools. Community promoters have compiled baseline information of producers on the ground using Cobo Collect tool. And they also have been following up the implementation of the practices of their group of farmers using this uh, tool. As I said, the capacity building through the farmer field schools is an innovative approach within the project. And we are leaving a human capital in the territories, not only for this initiative, but for some of the future initiatives um, in the country. And even when capacity building is very important, we cannot forget about technical assistance. And this has been also a key factor of success for the implementation of the practices because farmers can have access to this service and they also are more motivated for the implementation of the sustainable measures. So which are the sustainable agricultural practices? As, an, as I mentioned, these are not new. And we are working with no burning, no tillage, uh, stable management, contour line planting, live barriers, infiltration ditches, infiltration pits, uh, death barriers, the establishment of fodder bank with varieties tolerant to droughts and floods, um, the production of organic fertilizers, the establishment of agroforestry and civil pasture systems, the use of local varieties that are resistant, resilient to the conditions of the dry corridor and the implementation of drip irrigation systems <clears throat> in some areas where water is available. And even when we are not working with the concept of Quezon wild systems, eh, all the activities we are promoting among the farmers eh, include this important eh, element of eh, traditional knowledge, eh, including also an integrated man management, integrated pest management, and the use of or uh, of the biomass as a result of the prone of the trees uh, to fertilize and, and improve the soil. And all these practices also we are using the exact tool uh, for the estimation of carbon sequestration, and we already have a. Uh, 590,000 tons of carbon dioxide 
a equivalent capture uh, at this time at this stage of the project that uh, is the 70% of the goal we have and this is directly linked to the soil conservation soil fertility and moisture retention that um, impacts and improve the productivity and livelihoods of uh, our people. And I think that this is very key because uh, some of our producers, obviously they, they are aware about, uh, about taking care of the resources, but they also are uh, experiencing by themselves the benefits of implementing these practices in the cost reductions and the improvement of yields. So to sum up, uh, I just want to mention that it is very important, as other panelists have mentioned as well, to uh, focus on an integrated approach. It is very important to rescue the local knowledge, including innovative technologies, processes, capacity building, uh, technical assistance in order to reach uh, a better and, and sustainable dryland farming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcella, for sharing FAO's experience. Let's let's say you know how FAO is in action in this dry corridor. Uh, I think it's very interesting, and I also link it back to what Makiko, Beth, and uh, uh, Jackie said. You know, action at scale. I think through Green Climate Fund, although you know there is a sizable amount of funding. Uh, but to increase it at scale, it really, you know, requires government commitment and, and other stakeholder commitment to support the dry corridor program in the region where you are working. So thank you very much for that, uh, Marcella. Colleagues, now we have time, a bit of time, not much, for answering questions that are not yet uh, very, you know, answers that have been Q&A. Um, in, in, in the chat, and uh, I can see that some of the uh, uh, panels mem you know, have, have started answering these uh, questions, but not all of them, but let me have a quick look on these. Um, perhaps I can go to first to uh, Makiko. Uh, there is a question, I think, from uh, Mr. Alex Nyarko, uh, who is the FAO represent representative in Djibouti. Um, he is asking about, you know, where to get the cuttings of cactus because Djibouti is also dry. Uh, if you can attend to that question quickly, uh, Makiko, over to you. Thank you very much, Yurdi. I, I think I just as, answered that question in the chat too, but just quickly answering that, um, cactus does exist already in the country. So uh, first and foremost way is to best uh, make use of the, the species that are available, the Puntia species, but uh, the cactus net can also uh, facilitate uh, different uh, uh, genetic resources to be shared from uh, gene banks and other um, entities uh, through appropriate means. Uh, so please contact me for further information. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Makiko and Alex. Uh, this is an internal discussion that you will not follow. You will need to follow up with Makiko. Now we have this question from Sergio Torres. Uh, what is the percentage of smallholders that could have access to digital agriculture or even data that is understandable to all uh, and not dependent on the international or government cooperation? Perhaps Tomoko, you can shed some light on this if you have uh, you know, any idea. Um, I, that's a, that's a, you know, very difficult question, I think. You know, one is that, uh, like, I think there are a lot of different, you know, stakeholders in different digital ag programs, and, you know, they are working with it at different scales. Um, you know, in theory, I think there are, like, I think uh, there are different ways of reaching farmers. One is uh, directly trying to reach farmers through their mobile phones, but I think there are a lot of programs that are also just leveraging, you know, 
availability of mobile mobile phones in the community. So you can go through extension workers if you, you know, provide more real time information through extension workers. You may be able to reach farmers who don't actually have mobile phone access or or in remote areas. Um, you know, perhaps agro dealers and there are other kind of. Uh, lead the farmers in other points of contact within communities so, uh, that, that you can target in order to increase access to information indirectly as well. Um, so I don't have a specific percent number that I can, you know, I can share, but I think that uh, the probably the, the proportion is very, very high at this point. Okay. Is there any uh, uh, panel members who want to add to that? Uh, I think it also depends on the context, you know, and, and, and the condition in different countries, right? Any any of you want to add to that? I don't see any uh, hand from the panels. Um, I also uh, see quite a few of other questions. Um, for example, you know, Derek Makiko, please, how can we find you? <laughs> okay, very interesting question. So I'll leave it to you later, Makiko, to explain to Derek uh, where you are hiding in Rome. <laughs> okay. Um, I see that. Okay. Uh, Alejandro Gomez, the problem of dryland is that they are dry. Climate change will intensify this condition, particularly in hot countries. Can you expand uh, FAO suggested strategy to overcome this huge challenge, for instance, in Middle East or Mesoamerica? Uh, some comments on water energy nexus in rural zones. I think this is not only for FAO, I think it's also open to all panelists, right? So perhaps. Uh, I use my power to perhaps ask <laughs> Jackie, uh, what is your perspective on this, uh, Jackie? Um, how to, you know, to overcome this huge challenge, especially taking into account water energy nexus in the rural zone? Thank you. I was just thinking about water dry lands because there is water. There is, you can condense water in the desert in the mornings. You can find groundwater. But what's happening is that when you get sudden rains, like we're getting with climate change, it runs off. And we're not, it's not going into the water table. And so, yes, technically you're losing it. And I think that, Again, this is a huge regional approach because you can't fix the dry lands by fixing one corner of it. Um, greening across the Sahel with trees and other vegetation, that's a good start because if we can get it green, it will retain water. So decent crops that are not wasting water are not a bad way to start as well. And can I pass it to someone else now, Yodi? Yeah, thank you, Jackie, that is helpful. Um, any other panel members want to contribute to that? If not, then uh, I have a question also. Digital agriculture and new business models have a lot of potential to promote more resilient dryland systems. Um, what are key bottlenecks to developing and scaling up successful model? Perhaps I, I would like to ask Temi uh, or Tomoko to respond to that. Maybe start with Temi. No, thanks. Thanks very much, Yodi. I, I would say uh, uh, maybe two things. Uh, the, the first uh, bottleneck uh, would be uh, that, you know, many many of those business models are implemented by small and medium scale businesses uh, on the continent. And many of those businesses struggle a lot, uh, struggle for to access information, struggle to you know, understand the political dynamics and how it affects their businesses, you know, struggle to access the right resources, right? So I, I think one of the things we need to do is to uh, en encourage um, you know, the, the creation of you know, communities 
that encourage these businesses to be able to come together, work together, and really support each other, learn from each other. And maybe that's just what they need to, to be able to scale their, you know, um, unique innovative business models. And, and I've seen that in practice with the work uh, we're doing. I'm also the executive chair at African Food Change Makers, which is a, a you know, uh, a, a, a hub, uh, a community of entrepreneurs across the continent. And I'm beginning to see um, a lot of uh, impacts on businesses that are within the hub. Uh, currently, uh, the hub has members across more than 43 countries in Africa. And, you know, it keeps growing every day. And it shows that it's just one of those critical things that is, that is needed. Uh, the yeah. other, the second uh, point would be uh, every innovative business model, no matter how innovative it 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 it, it is, also require innovative financing. And, and I think, and I think we need to rethink, you know, the concept of financing for you know uh, agricultural innovations or business innovations in Africa, and ensure that. Uh, those businesses have access to the right, you know, financing that is not expensive and that is, you know, competitive. Thank you, Temi. Uh, Tomoko, any addition from you briefly? Maybe just a quickly kind of adding to Temi's last point about financing model. I think um, one thing, you know, that that's difficult is, uh, you know, when you're building a service for like a small scale pilot, you know, time bound pilot, the things that you need to figure out to, to be successful there may not be the same as things, the questions that you need to figure out to create a, you know, long term sustainable model at scale. You know, it's about technology needs, the data security, quality maintenance, and, you know, of course, importantly, resourcing as well. Um, so I think. I think just kind of bringing in how, you know, the vision of how the, the service would really look like and what you need to figure out um, from the beginning, I think is, is something really important, but but challenging yeah. because of the, the way a lot of the funding is structured. So. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, uh, last question, and I hope the answer will be brief. I would like to direct it to Shami and uh, Marcela uh, for you to, you know, to answer. What are some of the key technologies and innovation that you think have potential to truly impact dryland ecosystems and market systems in the coming years? Uh, Marcela, you might want to reflect, you know, from your, you know, GCF experience and, and Shami from your own experience in Africa. Maybe Shami, you can start first. Yes, uh, th thank you very much. Um, yeah, I just want to speak from the context of addressing the key pertinent challenges from a technological perspective, uh, water, carbon and nutrients. And we need integrated solutions that help to conserve water and then ensure that we are adding sufficient and balanced nutrients and then as well as carbon. So there's a whole uh, range of technologies that need to be fit into specific context. And um, conservation agriculture is one technology that um, has great potential because it addresses all the three um, you know, essential components, but we have to pay more attention to water harvesting, uh, water conservation, and then combine that with um, nutrient inputs uh, from uh, organic resources and mineral fertilizers, but more importantly, also invest in the right um, crops and uh, plant species that are adapted to the poor soils and low rainfall situations as well. And I want to highlight the role of legumes in the system where they can add high quality biomass for improving nitrogen supply that can actually add more nutrients through more sustainable processes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shami. And uh, Marcela? Yes, I think that um, it is very important to have technology in order to provide uh, what the forecast for farmers in terms of uh, decision making in El Salvador, for example, the big question every year is when should I plant? Yes. But still, we also need, for example, um, technical recommendations about how to prepare during the dry season just to face any event that can come within the rainy season. And sometimes farmers just, uh, they harvest their crops and they forget about the plot. Uh, but in the meantime, they can still 
uh, implement uh, sustainable practices just to minimize the impacts. Um, so I think that that's very important. That's why I really uh, was interested in, in what Tomoko shared about the app they, they already have. We are still yeah. working on how to provide this information to farmers. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Marcela. Very useful. Um, colleagues, I know that there are many questions, you know, because drylands are so huge, problems are so big, opportunities are so big, you know, potential are, you know, immense. Uh, I don't think we can solve all the questions at this webinar. Certainly from FAO part, what I can say is that we will continue, you know, to use this platform, uh, you know, to advance the discussion. Uh, but because of time, you know, I really would like uh, to end the webinar and it is my great honor to invite uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Mr. Abdul Hakim el -Wair, the Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for uh, North uh, Africa, RNE, who is here with us. Uh, thank you very much, Hakim, for your time. I know you are very busy. And uh, with that, you know, we give uh, the closing uh, to you. Over to you, Hakim. Thank you. Yuri, uh, thank you very much. And thank you to, I uh, see Beth Victor here and all the colleagues. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really grateful for, for this opportunity. What a great pleasure that we have here today. It's indeed a very important uh, webinar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, as we come to the close of this, uh, enlightening seminar on resilient dry lands, innovating for sustainable agriculture, landscapes, and livelihoods. I would like to express my deepest thanks, gratitude to all our speakers for sharing their expertise and all to all participants for your active engagement throughout the day. I think this is a very important subject and, and I'm, I'm really grateful for everybody. I represent the Near East and North Africa region, which is one of the driest regions, and we'll hear more about it. It has been a privilege to learn about the innovative approaches that are being implemented in dry land regions uh, across the globe, from Africa uh, to Central America to everywhere else in the world, each contributing to the creation of more resilient agricultural landscapes and livelihoods. Indeed, dry land does not mean wasteland. It uh, does not mean wasteland. So uh, uh, the, the, the urgency uh, for ecosystem restoration is very evident with uh, nearly uh, th three quarters of the region's rain-fed uh, cropland degraded and water scarcity projected to cause substantial uh, economic loss by 2050. In the Near East and North Africa region alone, one of the driest regions in the world, we face similar challenges, including water scarcity, drought, desertification, land use, rather land misuse, land use changes, and degradation, all of which are exacerbated by the impact of climate change leading to significant economic losses amounting to about $9 billion a year, uh, or up to about 7% of the national GDPs of our member countries. These issues have serious ramifications on the food security, livelihoods, and overall well-being of the populations mainly living in dry lands. Yet these challenges are not insurmountable. Um, the, the inspiring solutions that we've discussed and heard today, ranging from integrating traditional knowledge with cutting edge technologies to enhancing soil health and promoting agri-food entrepreneurship, prove that there are clear pathways and hopes and opportunities to sustainable development in dry land areas. One key takeaway from this webinar is that resilience in dry lands must be multifaceted. It cannot be a, a single direction. It is not just about increasing productivity, but also about preserving ecosystems, fostering innovation, and building local capacities 
to adapt to shocks and stresses. Most importantly, it is about empowering the farmers and communities who are at the heart of these very challenging landscapes. Silvopastoral strategies are particularly relevant to dryland areas with forests, woodlands, and mosaic of different land uses and tenor ecosystems. Trees in dryland forests and wooded areas provide essential ecosystems services, including animal feed, timber, fruits, shade, and regulation of soil and water cycles. Equally, livestock production is considered a key activity for food security. Local knowledge enhanced by research and innovation can create nature-based solutions that improve food security, support livelihoods, and restore dryland ecosystems, all while safeguarding ecosystem services and achieving land degradation neutrality. I would like to highlight here in particular the region from the Near East, the importance of the oasis regions. Most of the oases that we have are in the middle of the dry lands and the deserts. And there are key initiatives of creating alliances on oasis development that we'd like to focus on as we go in the future as one of the most fragile communities within dry lands. As we conclude the seminar, I urge each of you to take decisive actions. These are, there are several key action areas that I wish to highlight as a result of today's discussion. Notably, as a development community, we must, one, invest in research and innovation. Let us intensify our efforts to develop and scale up technologies tailored to dry land conditions. This includes not only agricultural innovations, but also digital solutions that can empower farmers and real-time information big data analytics, and improved market access. Two, promote policy integration. I urge policymakers to ensure that dry land agriculture is mainstreamed into na national development strategies, climate action plans, and food security policies. We need holistic approaches that recognize the interconnectedness of land, water, and biodiversity management. Three, foster partnerships. The complex challenges of dry land require collaborative solutions. Let us strengthen partnerships between governments, research institutions, the private sector, the local communities. FAO stands ready to facilitate these connections and provide technical support and guidance. Three, um, uh, sorry, four, empower local communities. We must ensure that the uh, custodians of dry land ecosystems, farmers, pastoralists, and indigenous people are at the heart of our interventions. Their knowledge and active participation are crucial for sustainable outcomes. Five, scale up successful models. Many of the solutions presented today are ripe for scaling up. I challenge all stakeholders to identify successful initiatives that can be adapted and expanded in your respective regions. Six and last, enhance knowledge sharing. The insights gained from this seminar, webinar, should not remain within these virtual walls. I encourage you to disseminate this knowledge widely, initiate follow-up discussions, and contribute to global platforms focused on dry land agriculture, focusing more on local communities. The United Nations Decade for on Ecosystem Restoration, which FAO is co-leading with UNEP, provides an excellent platform and an opportunity to disseminate the best practices across regions. Ladies and gentlemen, and all participants to this webinar, as we look ahead to the 29th session of the FAO Committee on Agriculture, 
and the ongoing implementation of the global program on sustainable dry land agriculture. Your active engagement will be crucial. I would also like to acknowledge the collaboration between the Committee on Agriculture, COAG, and the Committee on Forestry, COFO, on cross-sectoral matters, and the cooperation with members on scale-up actions on agriculture and forestry linkages. In the Near East and North Africa region, we have reflected this collaboration on dry land restoration through our regional conference of the ministers of agriculture within our Near East region. The transformation of dry land agri-food systems is not just an environmental necessity. It is a pathway to achieving multiple sustainable development goals, especially that we're approaching our target for 2030. And we know that we are 75% off track of all the SDGs. In closing, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to all speakers, participants, and organizers who have made this seminar a success. It's indeed uh, a lesson and a school to learn from for you know, one single day. Your dedication to this cause is truly inspiring. Let us leave here today, not just with new knowledge, but with a renewed commitment for action. Together we can build a resilient dry lands that sustain both people and the planet for generations to come. I really thank you, Yordi, and the whole uh, division for, 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 for organizing this seminar, bringing people from different aspects. And we at the Near East and North Africa region have learned a lot, being one of the driest regions in the world, of how do we sustain our ecosystems, especially in dry lands. So I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity and look forward for uh, continue to, le to learn lessons from, from such interactions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hakim, for your really, really excellent summaries with six accent points that you urge all of us to come. We promise we'll follow up. The team with me will, will not just stop in this, let's say, you know, online webinar. We will go into action together. Colleagues, uh, esteemed panel members, Participants, you know, I noticed at some point we are more than 230 and now until now we are still close to 140. Allow me on behalf of FAO also and to second the point of Hakim to thank all of you for making this webinar really a, a truly, you know, a platform for sharing, inspirational and also educational as Hakim said. Colleagues, with that, thank you so much. I wish you a nice evening, nice day, and uh, stay tuned. We will come back with more uh, high-quality webinar like this one. Thank you so much, colleagues, and bye-bye.